Good afternoon and welcome to the BBBA webinar on tax and regulatory update. Let's give it another couple of minutes so everybody can log in. Thank you. Hello again, I suggest we go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone uh, to the BBBA Tax and Regulatory Update. My name is Desislava Miteva. I'm the Executive Director of the British Bulgarian Business Association and uh, it will be my pleasure to be the moderator of today's event. We have lined up uh, a renowned list of speakers today that I will introduce to you uh, in a bit. But before we do that, I would like to uh, go ahead and thank all our annual sponsors. It, it is due to their support that we are able to, to host uh, events free of charge for our members. Th big thanks to Mobile Wave Solutions, Cleves, Deloitte, Landmark, Novotel Hotel, Sofia, and Bulgaria Insurance. We appreciate your support. I would also like to remind you about uh, some webinar basics, although I think by now all of us are experts on uh, online events uh, after having to, to run a lot of them for the past couple of years. But just quickly um, a reminder, the chat is disabled for all attendees and after each presentation you will have the opportunity to raise your questions in the Q&A panel that you will see um, at the bottom of your screen. In some cases we will have to take questions away to be answered later uh, but uh, no worries you will see the contact details of uh, all the presenters and um, uh, please don't hesitate to, to contact us and we'll make sure that they will respond to your questions later if they don't manage to do that in the allotted time. And last but not least, I would like to say that uh, the webinar will be recorded. So uh, don't worry uh, for taking too much notes. So you will be able to refer to the presentations later. And also, if you would like to, to share the presentations and uh, the webinar with some of your colleagues, uh, don't worry about that. You, you will have the link to, to the recording. And now I would like to uh, give the floor to the chair of the British Bulgarian Business Association, Gilbert McCall, for a welcome note. Gilbert. Thank you very much, Desi. I'd like to, as well as you, give a very warm welcome to all of those who are attending our seminar this afternoon. Um, and uh, it's mostly tax and regulatory updating us what's happening in 2022. We have uh, a wide range of, I hope, current topics that we're going to look at this afternoon. There's certainly an international flavor to it, to some extent a British flavor, but it's not just one thing or the other. It's topics that we think will be of value to, uh, to our members. Um, I'd also like to thank very much uh, the presenters and their firms for making uh, their time and expertise available to us. 
We believe this is one of the very important functions that uh, we as BBVA can offer to our members. And uh, I hope very much uh, that you will have an interesting and successful afternoon. So thank you very much. Back to you, Desi. Thank you very much, Gilbert. I would like to echo what you just said. Uh, this is uh, the event uh, that we regularly hold in the beginning of the year. And this is a good opportunity for our members to get an update uh, about what's new in uh, uh, Bulgarian legislation, but also uh, about some topics related to uh, the bilateral trade between Bulgaria and the UK. And uh, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our first presenters, uh, Bozulov and Chernobyl Law Firm. Uh, welcome to Angel and Marina, who will be telling us this uh, afternoon about how to fund your business using uh, crypto. Uh, what are the legal aspects of an ICO? Angel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Desi. Thank you, Gilbert. Hello all. Glad to have you here today in this webinar. Uh, today, we will try to briefly present some of the main aspects of uh, conducting of an ICO. Although uh, we know that uh, this, uh, this matter is still new and uh, if, not recent, if, if not soon regulated, it will still be new maybe even after a year or two from now. So uh, I'll be presenting the first part of our, our presentation. Uh, the second part, for the second part, which is mainly tax and IML, I will give the, the floor to, to Marina. Um, up until quite recently, mainstream fundraising instruments such as IPOs, private equity financing, sale of private debts were only available to relatively large corporations and as such were generally deemed as inaccessible by small and medium enterprises. Uh, what is more, they are often associated with uh, tedious and overly complicated regulatory, regulatory legal procedures, which are most in, in most of the time costly and time, time consuming. Uh, of course, in Bulgaria, we have to, we must give to the due credit to uh, platforms such as the B market of the Bulgarian Stock Exchange, which is uh, from, for the past year, providing small and medium enterprises with uh, an ample opportunity to raise funds uh, with, uh, within easier terms compared to those of the regulated markets. Uh, however, even with uh, BEAM, uh, we still, we, uh, in order to sell uh, shares, uh, you, sh you, sh you should still be in certain mature stage of the development of your business. It's uh, usually fit for, uh, for companies which, are, which either have some assets, some initial investment, some uh, uh, financial history. So uh, this in turn has led many of the investors and uh, investees alike in seeking more and more innovative and convenient solutions for, for the fundraising problem. So, uh, uh, please, we should go to slide three already. Thanks. Uh, so uh, then the initial coin offering, offerings come. Uh, you know that following the arrival of crypto technology and uh, rapid advancement of the, in the area of initial coin offer, offerings, many entrepreneurs uh, quickly discovered that this new and uh, untapped form of fundraising provide much more flexible way for a gathering of capital. Even uh, what is more important uh, in extremely early stages of most business projects. So uh, in fact, ICOs are becoming an, increasing, uh, an increasingly popular method for a plethora of startups and other companies to introduce funding and allow for investors to participate in fundraising aimed towards pro projects still in the early concept stage. Uh, the, the, in, in general, uh, during an ICO, uh, investor participates in the fundraising by transferring fiat currencies or 
uh, very often stable crypto tokens or other cryptocurrencies currencies to the issuer of the new digital tokens and that is and the issuer is this is the mechanism uh, by means the issuer is gathering capital usually um, contrary to the traditional ipos most tokens typically do not represent ownership interest or dividend right or any other type of receivable which could qualify such tokens as a security um, of course uh, within the terminology of crypto entrepreneurs an initial sale of security tokens is also an inst uh, a possible instrument which is uh, known in the practice of security token offerings so basically we before starting of an ico we should uh, know the difference between these two uh, crypto units security and utility uh, please slide four uh, slide four yes uh, there is a huge difference between uh, uh, utility and security token laying in the in the economics of the of the project and uh, if and whether and connected to the fact whether this uh, new crypto unit is uh, somehow related to a company asset uh, is uh, giving some rights such as voting rights dividend rights or some receivable to the investor paying money to receive this token when this when some of these parameters of the token are actually presented usually this is treated as a security not only in the usa where, where regulations are uh, very strict and strict and not crypto friendly but also recently in the eu uh, well the but this is why the most common type of tokens that are usually issued in an ICO are utility tokens, or at least this is how the founders try to qualify the tokens when they issue them. Later in the presentation, you'll see that uh, uh, in many cases, uh, what the founders think about their token and what the regulators think is quite different. And uh, then the problems and the sanctions come. So if you're uh, planning to start an ICO, it's very important to uh, elaborate uh, the economics behind the token and what exactly are you giving to the, um, to the investor that is purchasing the token. If it's not a security token, the utility token is usually uh, providing the, the purchaser with uh, the option to use this token as a purchase mean for the issuer's services or goods or the plant services or goods if it's a uh, startup issuing the tokens. Uh, what are the advantages of the ICO fundraising? Slide five. Based on our experience, uh, the, the advantage is that most of the entrepreneurs are seeking while starting an ICO are uh, the biggest, the bigger in, uh, investors pool. Practically uh, no IPO currently can give you, uh, or at least no local IPO can give you uh, a global investor pool, which is actually the case with the ICOs. ICOs are usually addressing the global crypto community. Uh, other important advantage is that uh, there is practically no risk of dilution of your business. If you're issuing utility tokens, you're usually not giving any uh, rights, not, not uh, creating any debt uh, towards the uh, token investors. So practically the only right they usually uh, have is to potentially use uh, the utility token to purchase goods or services, but when, if it's if it's a startup, when your platform or when your business is ready to sell such goods or goods or services. 
A uh, huge advantage of the utility token is that, as we mentioned above, is that it's actually not really a, neither a capital financing nor a debt financing. It usually doesn't create any uh, substantial liability of the issuer to put in, uh, in his balance sheet. Overall, worldwide in 2019, before the COVID crisis, more than 3 billion US dollars were collected through ICOs. Uh, and for the only for January 2021, 5,721 ICO projects raised more than 27 billion US dollars. So what is what is uh, what we should start with if you if you are starting with an ICO, the crucial and the um, most important uh, milestone is the white paper. Next slide. So before anyone dives into the this brave new world of crypto, an important consideration must be taken into account. Uh, of course, will, will the business be considered attractive for investors to place their money? While it's uh, true that recently the crypto market has gone into hiatus and many currencies uh, gathered attention and funds based entirely on the hype, experienced investors can easily determine whether your business is compatible enough with the crypto world and with technology in general. So a centerpiece of the ICO should be uh, the white paper. The white paper is uh, a constitutive document of the ICO, which is uh, to a large ex extent expired by the IPO prospectus. Uh, basically, you use the white paper first to give some general description of the project, but also to convince any potential investors on the benefits and uh, on the benefits from your project, project and uh, the necessity of the funds to be gathered and of course of your business plan, all these important aspects. So usually the, the, under the good trade practices, the white paper include clear and specific details about what's the founder's business idea or what's the nature of the business. Um, what is the current or planned scope, scope or model of operation? Or what is the technology behind the project? Usually also profile of the founders and the development team is presented in the white paper. Um, the business plan, a business plan of uh, which is uh, presenting how the, the gather funds will potentially be used uh, together with some development roadmap. And of course, similarly to the IPO, uh, the white paper usually sets uh, soft and hard caps, as the soft cap is uh, the boundary from which you're assessing whether the ICO was uh, successful or not. Well, white paper uh, is still a document that is uh, that is uh, the, the 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 centerpiece of the ICO under only under the good commercial practices but as uh, many of you might know there is a draft of crypto directive marketing crypto instruments directive which is uh, still not uh, adopted by the EU but uh, if if uh, soon adopted and implemented uh, the, the, under this directive, the white paper will most likely be regulated of, as a mandatory constitutive document for each ICO. So, uh, as, as I mentioned above, uh, very important part of the white paper is the so-called tokenomics or the economics behind the token. This is usually a uh, very important part to um, first to uh, to explain before the potential investors why this uh, new token is interesting. Uh, the, the economic projection behind the token, 
why uh, what is the the mechanism of using the token but uh, last last but not the least why the token is not a security because if uh, the, the tokenomics lay down the, the basis of the of the relations between the issuer and the investor. Basically, the the, the tokenomics that uh, are fixed in the white paper uh, put several important criteria. Uh, what portion of the entire token supply? Uh, can be distributed to only one investor. Usually capped amounts of tokens are uh, provided for uh, one investor with the exception of uh, uh, individual investors with uh, higher financial capabilities, which are usually allowed to, to purchase more than the, more than the, the cap per, per investor. Uh, of course, some under the based on our experience many of the uh, many of the ico projects also provide some token team token reserves certain per percentage of the to total token supply is uh, usually being set aside exclusively for the founders development team advisors and so on the tokenomics of course is determining the token price uh and how the token will be distributed as recently more and more uh apart from the ico from the centralized ico organized by an issuer many uh ico founders are using also a hybrid model of initial offering by uh firstly making a, an initial coin offering and then making uh, an initial uh, crypto exchange or decentralized crypto exchange offerings. So what are the main regulatory aspects? Slide seven. Many jurisdictions currently rely on the application of existing say, securities and financial market reg regulations towards the ICOs, but this is uh, not very successful. It's uh, the need of explicit regulation is uh, more and more visible with the progress of uh, of uh, crypto and uh, with with the progress of technology. It is important to know how to note, however, that a noticeable trend exists towards the continuing implementation of new regulations, tailored especially towards cryptocurrencies, crypto assets, and initial coin offerings. As I already mentioned, one of these regulations that is still a project, but uh, hopefully it will uh, soon become reality, is the uh, European Parliament markets in crypto assets regulations. Uh, but in, in some of the national jurisdictions, such as France, Switzerland, Germany, uh, regulations are already existing on a national level. Uh, the first, the first regulation, and the first and most important regulation any ICO organizer should be uh, ICO organizer should be careful about before starting ICO is the securities regulations. Are the securities regulations? Slide eight. Key moment for for such organizer should be to assess whether the ICO and the token to be issued following the scope in the securities regulations uh, in the territories where the token shall be offered and distributed. So practically uh, the eligibility regarding which token falls in the scope in the national securities regu regulations differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. A most notable example in this case are the United States where the Securities and Exchange Commission issues uh, that most token offers, offerings are indeed subject to registration or authorization. This is why one of the first and most important steps to conduct a thorough research on crypto-friendly jurisdiction where the ICOs could potentially take place. Uh, 
another stage which is deemed preliminary to the overall execution of the ICO is the careful execution of securities and financial instruments analysis. Uh, and this is when this, this should happen on uh, the stage when we are still having only draft of the white paper and uh, early projections of the tokenomics of the project. So basically before uh, white paper is uh, published and before the fundraising has started, the first and most important thing the organizer of an ICO should do is to uh, have an idea if this token somehow could qualify as a security of, or financial instrument. Uh, the, the European Securities Legislation, slide nine, the European Securities Legislation, or more, more uh, specifically, the Euro European Financial Instruments Legislation uh, under the uh, Markets and Financial Instruments Directive is, uh, of course, for any European uh, ICO founder, uh, the, 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 the first analysis which should be conducted. So, Basically, I may say that based on our experience, uh, EU laws are crypto friendly. And in most of the cases, an ICO, which is structured as a utility token offering, uh, is not subject to authorization or not treated as a non authorized IPO by the local authorities. Uh, survey executed by the European Securities and Market Authorities amongst uh, competent national financial authorities in 2008 uh, showed that actually most of the ICOs uh, under monitoring by the, by the national authorities were not treated as uh, non-authorized IPOs. So basically, the local regulators around Europe are uh, not qualifying most of the utility tokens as security or financial instrument. They treat them as something quite different, usually as a digital asset or a payment mean. Uh, but this is maybe because the EU regulatory bodies have much more explicit approach when defining what is a financial instrument or security compared, for instance, to the US regulator. Uh, most of, most of the, um, the, the, the financial instruments under the MIFID II are um, explicitly defined and described. And if uh, something does not fall into the scope of uh, any of these definitions, then it's just not this type of financial instrument. And practically, uh, when, it, when we're speaking of a utility token, which is not uh, providing to uh, the purchaser neither a, a right to receive some asset, nor uh, the right to receive some profit or dividends, nor any other type of, nor is creating any debt, then uh, usually the EU regulators are not treating such instrument as a, as a financial instrument or a security. However, unfortunately, this is not the case with the US uh, SEC. Uh, but Mainly, this is mainly because of the uh, regulatory differences and uh, uh, differences in the wording of the uh, in the MIF, of the MIFID V and, and the uh, U.S. Securities Act. So uh, we also included a brief resume on the U.S. legislation with the disclaimer that, of course, we are not. U.S. attorneys, but uh, uh, often in the ICOs, we, are, we need to make some independent research based on publicly available, available sources. So in slide 10, we have 
put some main aspects uh, related to the US legislation in, uh, in the securities scope. Slide 10, please. Yeah. Apart from the explicit in the, the, the securities, uh, the, the central um, central act regulating securities in the United States is the U.S. Securities Act, uh, adopted I think in maybe 1931 or 33, uh, and the the main regulatory body is the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, similarly to the MIFID II, the U.S. Securities Act also sets a very, very strict definition describing the uh, key parameters of most of the securities. However, in compared to the MIFID II, uh, the U.S. Securities Act also uh, sets one very broad definition called an investment contract. So whenever uh, certain instrument doesn't fall in the scope of any of the other types of securities. Usually SEC analyzes whether or not such uh, instrument falls in the, into the broad definition of the investment contract. This is usually done by conducting the so-called Howey test. Actually the Howey test referred to a, a Supreme Court case from the, from the 1940 on a very, of course, very different matter than crypto. It was about uh, some agreements on citrus, citrus growths or uh, some kind of fruits, but uh, it's still used also to assess whether, uh, for instance, a utility token is actually a non-authorized uh, security offering. Angel, apologies to, to interrupt. Yes. May I ask you to, to wrap up a little bit because we are running yes. out of time for the slot. Thank sorry. You. I'm sorry. Yeah. I will, I will uh, complete this part with just saying that the how test is usually conducted based on four criteria. And if all the four criteria are met, then uh, SEC usually treats this instrument as a security, an investment of money, in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit to be derived from the efforts of others. Briefly, SEC, SEC, in the opinion of SEC, uh, most of the utility token, the tokens issued are covering both these, all, all of these four criteria. So that is why notorious projects as DAO, Ripple, Telegram, and Kik were all had unfortunate experience and were under investigation from SEC, uh, even though they were F, uh, were marketed as uh, utility token I ICOs. Slide 11, briefly, the other important uh, aspect of uh, an ICO is to set a contractual framework. Uh, any ICO organizer should be prepared to have uh, uh, general terms contract for sale of tokens. Usually, most of the organizer are, organizers are putting uh, serious disclaimers towards the legal legal nature of the token because it's still not regulated, and towards uh, any potential hack attacks, viruses, and uh, malicious acts by third parties. It is very important to know that. Uh, breach or non-fulfillment of um, the ICO organizer to deliver the token uh, is uh, making any contrary claims of the invest investor hardly enforceable because still we don't have any uh, legal instrument to enforce against a crypto wallet. Thank you all, and I'm passing the floor to Marina. I hope that she will be, uh, she will make a brief presentation on the tax aspects. 
Thank you, Angel Marina. I would really appreciate it if you go, could go quickly through the slides so we can allow some time for questions as well. Yes, I will try to be very quick but informative. And uh, despite the fact that there are uh, still no strict regulation in the field of uh, the ICO in Europe, as uh, Angel said, uh, the fiscal authorities have been clear for years regarding the tax treatment of, of the income from these activities. Um, in Bulgaria, the profit, um, the profit gains um, from trading with cryptocurrency are subject to income tax. Uh, the rate of this tax is standard and it is 10%, uh, but uh, very often the challenge is how to calculate the taxable amount. Uh, in general, it is, is the difference between the profit gain and the loss incurred within uh, each calendar, calendar year uh, from the sale or exchange of the cryptocurrency. Mm, it is important to note uh, that uh, currently two types of um, transactions with crypto are taxed here in Bulgaria. Uh, the first one is uh, the sale or the exchange of cryptocurrency for fiat money. And the second one is uh, the swapping one type of cryptocurrency for another crypto asset. Mm. In some situation, although the activities are carried out by a natural person and uh, not by a company, uh, it can be treated as a commercial activity. Uh, this is extremely important because the commercial trading, um, um, because a commercial trading uh, organized by a natural person is subject to higher tax. Uh, here the rate is uh, 15% instead of the 10%. Um, to distinguish between the commercial and non-commercial activity, the authorities uh, apply the standard criteria to the criteria is uh, to all transaction. Does it amount to professional activity uh, done as occupation pro profit or not? In brief, uh, the income from cryptocurrency transactions is always taxable. Uh, the only volatility uh, being regarding the applicable tax rate. Uh, if the business uh, is registered as a legal entity, um, then its activity will be subject to a corporate tax, which is 10% uh, again. Uh, the taxable amount uh, should be calculated uh, as the difference between the profit gained and the loss incurred. I said before. Mm. Most of the utility token are defined as a payment instrument when it comes to the value added tax. Uh, because of this, uh, the deals with such kind of tokens are exempt from VAT. Uh, this treatment uh, derives from the Court of Justice of the European Union. Um, the, court uh, the court pronounced some principle, uh, principles which uh, must be used in inter interpreting the EU legislation. Uh, that's so the same treatment uh, should apply across the European Union. Uh, but it is uh, important to note uh, that uh, not all of the crypto assets um, is uh, not uh, um, is not uh, with uh, but um, the main challenge when it comes to the transactions with uh, the popular NFTs uh, is. Uh, here, it is considered that uh, one NFT is uh, not identical with any other token and uh, they cannot be replaced. In this regard, uh, their, object of, uh, their objects of uh, intellectual property rather than cryptocurrency. Uh, with this in mind, although there is currently no uniform 
European practice on this issue, uh, we believe that uh, it is uh, very possible that transactions with the NFTs uh, will not be exempt from VAT. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, just a few words about the IML aspects. Um, we must mention that uh, at the moment the platforms uh, that exchange between virtual and uh, a virtual currency and legal tender are obliged to implement uh, certain IML measures. According to the national risk assessment uh, in Bulgaria, the operations with uh, virtual currency are high risky. In this regard, we recommend that uh, those engaged in cryptocurrency activities and the ICO project should uh, implement rules for knowing their clients and uh, check them in certain European sanction lists in order to prevent suspicious transactions. Mm, the information collect uh, must be sufficient to identify the customer. Uh, this includes at least uh, the name, the date of birth, uh, nationality, and uh, residency of the client. Of course, uh, when it comes to collecting personal data, one question always arises. Uh, this is uh, the legal basis for processing the data. We believe that uh, in this case, at least two bases uh, can be justified. The first one is the legal obligation. As we mentioned, uh, the exchange platforms are obliged under the IML Act. Uh, in addition, um, this data will be needed in order to enter into a contractual re relationships with the client. Uh, however, we always recommending uh, we also we always recommend explain uh, explain the customers uh, exactly why this information is being collecting and uh, asking for their consent for uh, process. Um, I think that uh, this is the end of uh, our presentations. Thank you very much, uh, Marina and Angel. There was one question what uh, AML stands for, if you could clarify. Uh, anti money laundering. Anti money laundering. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much uh, to both of you. Um, we are running out of time. I, I would suggest that uh, if there are any questions, um, we can take them one question now or uh, and um, you can see the contacts uh, for for angel here and i'm sure he will be delighted to respond to the questions after the webinar yes of course any questions from from our attendees i don't see any so thank you very much uh, angel and maria i realize it's a very broad topic and uh, it was very informative to to learn about uh, uh, both the, the legal and tax uh, aspects and now i would like to suggest that we uh, move to the next presentation uh, nicola seymenov who is the manager global employee services at deloitte will be telling us about the mobility of people between bulgaria and the uk we covered this topic in the previous uh, legal and uh, uh, tax update that we had about a year ago. And uh, now, uh, Nikki, we would appreciate uh, an update about what's going on in this direction. The floor is yours. Thank you, Desi. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to be a part of the event for a second straight year. So we are radically changing topics from cryptocurrencies and investing. We're going to global mobility, which is nonetheless a very important subject uh, for everybody who is doing business in Bulgaria and in the UK. And of course, investors have to travel during the, between the two countries here in, in these strange times that we are now living. So with that being said, uh, I'm going to uh, give a heads up on two main points, which are the immigration impact and the personal tax and social security impact. 
because both of them are valid and uh, very important for the global mobility, for the movement, and basically for of people and for the doing business in Bulgaria and in the UK. Uh, so we are going to start with the immigration impact and uh, we are going to uh, give basically the highlights on uh, three main points. First is short-term mobility and establishing a business. Second is long-term mobility and the third is contractors and freelancers. Now I'm going to give you an update on what is happening from the Bulgarian perspective to the fullest extent possible. And uh, regarding the UK aspects, uh, which are also similar, but not very identical, I will provide some highlights uh, upon request and of course interest. We can contact our colleagues in the UK who are specialized in UK tax and immigration matters who can give more perspective. So if you want, to come to Bulgaria on a short-term basis. What do you do? Uh, the usual perception when Brexit happened was that uh, there are going to be huge impediments to doing business and for traveling. Uh, fortunately, did, this did not occur. Uh, it was signed a trade and cooperation agreement between Bulgaria and the UK governing the relations between both countries, after, uh, between the community and the UK, sorry, after the, the Brexit occurred. And in this trade and cooperation agreements, uh, there are very interesting terms, uh, which provide for uh, some uh, rules about both the mobility and so the rules for doing business. Now, if you're an UK investor and you want to come to Bulgaria or basically UK national, you can come and enter Bulgaria based on your passport uh, and stay here for up to 90 days. This is the so-called short-term visit. And uh, what is important uh, in addition to the, of, your, of course, your right being able to enter is what you can do during these 90 days. So first of all, uh, you can go and uh, perform some activities which are auxiliary to business. For example, you can go to a business meeting, you can go to a trade fair, you can go to an uh, uh, event which is of importance to uh, developing your business like such a webinar or a seminar. Uh, and then uh, you can also go uh, to perform activities which are related to education or qualification. This is the second part. And here you can, it is important that you, if you want to attend a seminar or a training which is unpaid or uh, engage in some research, you can also do it within this list of permitted activities. And the last, of course, and not least, if you want to come to Bulgaria only for tourism, you can do it again for a period of up to 90 days. There is a whole list of permitted activities which is published uh, on the website of uh, the Bulgarian authorities and also on the website of the British government if you want to go and visit the UK. Uh, and they're basically uh, mirroring each other. So pretty much the same what you're allowed to do in Bulgaria, you can also do in the UK. Uh, I would suggest that if you want to come for a short-term visit, especially to Bulgaria, just to check what is permitted and what is not, in order not to end up in a situation where uh, it will turn out that you may need some type of a permission for performing these activities. For example, you cannot provide paid activities or uh, engage in work deliverables or work for a Bulgarian company only on a short-term business visitor basis. This is not allowed. Uh, and one more thing, which is very important, especially for investors and for multinationals who can, uh, who would like to come invest in Bulgaria, open a subsidiary, uh, the activities uh, for establishing a company or incorporate the company, they're permitted. So you can come within the visa last day. You can do all of the incorporation related formalities. You're not going to need a visa for that. So this is permitted. Next slide, please. Now, what happens if you uh, have come to Bulgaria on a short-term basis, but you would like to engage in long-term work? So basically, there are two types of uh, options which we are going to uh, look upon here. First of all, is if, uh, for example, you own a business, you incorporated a company, and uh, you would like to work and stay here as the MD, meaning a company representative, CEO, or a managing director, or a branch manager, in case we are talking about the branch of a foreign company which established a branch office here. Uh, in this case, uh, you do not need the so-called permission for access to the Bulgarian labor market. You don't need the work permit, uh, which uh, considerably facilitates the process, uh, especially in arranging the immigration status of UK nationals. 
There is a catch, however, in order for you to be eligible uh, for a visa and for stay in Bulgaria, the business which you have opened needs to employ at least 10 Bulgarian nationals, which means that Bulgarian government allows uh, doing executive activities based on corporate registration, but your business must be viable. It must not be like a hollow company established only for the purpose that uh, you come here and get a residence permit and stay in Bulgaria. Similar rules also exist in the UK. Now, what happens if you're an employee, but uh, you still want to come and work in Bulgaria? In this case, you're going to need the so-called work permit or permission for access to the Bulgarian labor market. And here, uh, the process consists of actually two steps. The first is the work authorization. The second is the long-term visa. And the third is the residency permit. Now, ex there exist different arrangements. So I'm just going to give the two main ones, which uh, I consider in our experience are the most important ones for the business, business organizations and especially for the multinationals. The first one is the EU blue card for highly qualified employment. So for example, if you're a highly skilled employee uh, who wants to work here on a Bulgarian labor contract, uh, you can do so under an alleviated procedure. You still need to get the work permits. You still need to get the visa and the residence permit. And uh, by the way, we have a change in the process effective as of last summer, uh, where uh, everything is done on the same desk. So you cannot, uh, you do not have to apply before three different institutions. Uh, this process has to be completed. The advantage is that uh, you have a permission to work and reside for four years. So this means that actually once you get through all the bureaucracy, you are clear and good to go to stay and live and work for a relatively longer period of time, which is still fixed. You cannot get an open-ended contract anymore, unfortunately. Uh, and in the UK, they have the same thing, but it is called the skilled visa. So it's again for skilled workers. Uh, and if you're a Bulgarian national and wish to go and work in the UK, uh, and take this highly paid job or highly skilled job, you can still apply for the highly skilled visa or skilled visa, which gives basically the same rights. Now, what happens, however, if you're an employee of a multinational company who has a subsidiary in Bulgaria, but you do not wish to terminate your employment in your home country, in the UK? Is it possible to still work? Yes, and uh, the procedure for this is called intracorporate transfer. Here, there are two main points which uh, the investors and the business need to take into consideration. The first is that both the companies must be part of one and the same corporate group, which means that either the uh, foreign employee in the UK has to own 100% or more than 50% of the Bulgarian subsidiary, or the UK company and the Bulgarian company must be commonly owned or under, let's say, the common umbrella. They, have, they must have a common HQ head office. Uh, and the second uh, is that uh, you need to have had an employment history before coming to work in Bulgaria as an employee of your home company. So there are different durations based on the status, whether you're a manager or a specialist. It is even possible for trainees if you want to come here in Bulgaria and do an internship if you're employed or a trainee at a foreign company and uh, finish your education and skill and be able to, to return back to the UK after the transfer finishes. And here, Again, we have a more beneficial regime, unlike the common Bulgarian residence permit, which is for one year. Uh, this gives the right to a three-year work permit, three-year work and residence in Bulgaria without interruption. Uh, in the UK, they also have the ICT or the intracorporate transfer. However, the rules there are a bit different and uh, they are more or less, uh, let's say linked or connected with uh, a certain salary grade. So last year it was like around, uh, 80,000 British pounds per year. For this year, the amounts are, at least to my knowledge, are not yet publicly available, but again, this can be checked with the UK authorities. And of course, if you need additional support or guidance, uh, there is a possibility always to establish contact with the white UK. Next slide, please. So what happens if you fall in neither of the categories, for example, if you're a lawyer or other self-employed person, or if you are coming to work in Bulgaria on a project basis. For example, there is a project, uh, you need, for example, to upgrade the IT software of a bank. Uh, you come here to work on the intercompany, uh, inter companies contract between the Bulgarian company and your UK employer. And uh, it is not your intention to stay like longer than one year. Well, both options are still possible. 
and uh, for the contractual services supplies, the services are permitted, but you need to obtain a work permission again, a long-term visa and residence permit prior to traveling. This is very important because otherwise uh, both the host company and the individual uh, may be subject to penalties, which are both monetary and uh, leading to termination of the stay of the individual in Bulgaria. This work permit, unlike others, is limited only for 12 months and cannot be extended. Uh, and this is because it is related to a certain project. So the rules are again alleviated. You don't have to do the so-called market testing or engage in any other preliminary activities before filing the work permit application. But you need to know and you need to be able to prove that there is an actual services contract between the employer and the company which is receiving the services in Bulgaria and that this contract envisages the, the work of the respective employee coming from the UK to Bulgaria. Uh, one more thing, there is no automatic recognition of professional qualifications or diplomas and, or licenses. This needs to be completed additionally now that UK is no longer part of the EU. And uh, this is also very important uh, if the service which is to be done by the employee who is a contractual supplier or works for a contractual supplier uh, falls in this field of uh, activity which requires a professional license or professional qualification. The last category of mobility which I would like to discuss here, these are the independent professionals which are like lawyers, architects, doctors. Uh, here the regime is a little bit more restrictive and uh, presupposes uh, additional requirements before you're able to engage in a self-employed or uh, freelance activities. Uh, to get such a permit in Bulgaria, it is not that easy. Maybe it is the hardest of all categories which I have listed before, but you need to have a business plan. You need to have an approval uh, from a specific authority in Bulgaria. You need also to have your diplomas and qualifications for a recognized officially in Bulgaria. For example, if you're a UK barrister, you need to take a certain exam here in Bulgaria in order to be able to practice. And uh, a requirement which in my case is, in my opinion at least, is not very considered is that you need to know Bulgarian language, at least to a certain extent. Uh, which uh, basically limits a bit uh, the categories of independent professionals who can work in Bulgaria. But again, if you have the background and you can correspond to the requirements, there's just a process that has to be completed. And uh, more or less, this is about the, the immigration process. These are the main points that I wanted to mention. I know that now it is different and it is more difficult uh, compared to the period when the UK was part of the EU, but more or less it is what it is. And uh, even though uh, the UK left the community, there are still rules which facilitate the, the movement of people. Uh, you do have to complete some sort of an administrative process, which is harder than the one which UK nationals may have been used to or vice versa Bulgarian nationals working in the UK, but it's still possible. And with that being said, I would like to speak a bit about the taxes, which is also a very important topic. So what happens with the taxes? Uh, unlike uh, the immigration process, the situation with the taxes remains more or less similar. So there was and there still is a treaty of avoidance of double taxation between Bulgaria and the UK, which is important for the investors, both individual and of course for companies on a corporate level, but that's a different topic. Uh, a topic worth mentioning here is that under Bulgarian tax law, there used to be some exemptions uh, which were available if, for example, uh, certain income was, rece was received uh, from sources in the UK. For example, if you trade in securities or trade in shares or have capital gains and buy and sell them on regulated stock exchanges within the European Union, this is non-taxable and uh, non-subject to reporting in the Bulgarian tax return. So if you have a capital gain from shares of, let's say, Daimler traded in Germany, and you get a huge capital gain, this is non-taxable. It used to be the same for the UK, but now since uh, the UK has officially left the EU, capital gains from uh, such transactions which are carried on the London Stock Exchange uh, for Bulgarian tax residents, for example, if you trade in shares or stocks, on a regulated market in the UK are no longer exempt. And this is uh, something which is, may have unfavorable, let's say, implications on uh, individual investors, but uh, this is something that 
has now changed and uh, has uh, developed, the Bulgarian authorities have developed a practice over the years, so this is no longer non-taxable. Uh, but one thing, and this, I think this is the hugest update compared to last year because uh, there were, it was not very clear at the time, it's about the social security. So say you're a UK national who have worked like 10 years in Bulgaria and now you have to come back to the UK or for some reason Brexit is a fact and you start wondering what happens with the rights and uh, the insurance contributions and everything that they have paid working in another country. Or even worse, if you're a Bulgarian national working in the UK who has been subject to high amounts of national insurance and uh, you're considering what is happening with my pension rights, with uh, the money that I have paid. Is it all lost because uh, the UK is now not a part of the EU and Bulgaria does not have a social security agreement separate with the UK? Well, here there are good news. And actually there has been a development compared to the last update. Uh, there is a protocol for social security coordination, which is again part of uh, this agreement for trade and cooperation between the UK and the EU. And basically more or less it uh, covers the provisions of the European regulations, uh, which were in force for Bulgarian and for UK nationals before Brexit. So basically the, the idea of this uh, protocol for social security coordination is to incorporate the EU rules so that no social security rights are lost. So now we are talking about material and personal scope. Material scope is the benefits and uh, the rights which you can get under these agreements. This uh, sorry protocol for social security coordination. And the good news is that it is all the same and all the benefits are covered with one exception, family benefits for the family members. So if you paid social security contributions and uh, contributed to the system in Bulgaria or in the UK in the previous year before Brexit, this will not be lost. The second important thing is to whom this actually beneficial provision apply. So this applies for EU EA citizens, inclusive UK nationals, family members and heirs, and even stateless persons refugees. So in terms of social security, and this is maybe the most favorable and important update compared to last year, there have been uh, developments and, a, and a protocol for coordination of the systems and the pension rights and the accumulated periods and the contributions which were paid, they will not be lost. Uh, and uh, this is very important. We have even seen A1 certificates, which were the certificates of coverage issued the regulations, uh, issued now for, for a Bulgarian national uh, and for UK national. So this uh, protocol for social security coordination works. Uh, there, the idea is to avoid both payment of double social security and loss of pension and insurable rights. And I think that I have finished my part a little bit faster. Sorry for that if I was speaking very fast, but this gives time for more questions now. So I would like to give the word to the audience. Thank you very much, Nikki, And thank you also for finishing on a positive note. We like good news. Uh, now I would like to open the floor uh, for questions. I don't see any in the Q&A section. Um, I would encourage all attendees to post question, uh, questions during the presentations as well, uh, not to wait until the last minute for, for the Q&A. Which means that uh, everything was either everything was understood very clearly, or I did not <laughs> give the impression of talking about it important at all, or it was very misunderstood. No, I'm seriously, I'm just joking. If you have questions, now is the time. Please ask them. If you don't, uh, my contact details are available and will be shared by the BBBA together with the presentation. Yes, and also the the presentation slides, uh, which are very informative as well. Ah, here is one question. Okay, so let's question. Uh, do we expect any minutes? So the question is from Tim uh, Bussere, do you expect any mutual recognition of professional qualifications? Well, it is unclear at this point, but I would rather say no, because uh, this is the way it is done for all the rest of the world, which is not part of the EU. And uh, I do not have any positive feedback on, on this. Uh, if we do have a development, I'll keep you posted and maybe we should an update or a newsletter. Great. Thank you, Nikki. 
Okay, thank you again for, for your presentation on a topic that is always uh, very important for uh, BBBA members. I would like now to, to move to, to the next presentation. It also, was a pleasure, Desi. Thank you. Thank you. Eli, can we move on to the next slide? Yeah, thank you. The next topic is um, also widely discussed uh, in, um, in the media and uh, everywhere in the past months. I would like to give the floor uh, to Julian Michu from PwC to give us uh, an update on the EU whistleblower directive. Yuli, the floor is yours. Thank you, Desi, and, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'll try to entertain you a bit instead of having my corporate logo behind me. Uh, you would enjoy this nice lady on, on the painting on the wall in my office. Um, the EU whistleblower uh, protection directive um, really has become a hot topic in the last months of 2021, simply because there was a deadline for transpositioning this directive in the national legislation of the EU member states, which was the 17th of December. Uh, but in reality, only six of the 27 member states managed to meet the deadline. And as you would imagine, and we can move to the next slide, um, Bulgaria is not one of them. Um, I just tried to do a heat map of the Central and Eastern European territories just to have a, a reasonable comparative analysis. And as you can see, the only country that in fact has done it is a, one of the three Baltics, uh, which is uh, Latvia. Um, Hungary has not started yet at all, and all the other states are in, in process of of passing the appropriate legislation. And obviously it's, it's a very natural question why none of these uh, EU member states managed to meet the deadline. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, the first and most common one is the COVID-19 pandemics, uh, which put away the attention of the government on, on more and more topics, uh, particularly dealing with the health and economic impact, uh, which the pandemics had on the uh, EU member states. Uh, in some territories, including Bulgaria, uh, bureaucracy really uh, demonstrated to be a slow process. Um, some countries have elections or political crises, like um, it was the case in Bulgaria. Uh, in some of the territories who are really very much advanced, for example, the Czech Republic, which has a draft law ready to be voted in February 2021, uh, all of a sudden, the political crisis and, and the um, extraordinary elections there uh, actually stopped the process and, and Czech Republic is more or less where we stand right now. Another interesting reason uh, why there was a delay was um, various types of dilemmas which the countries faced when they were discussing the draft legislation on transpositioning the directive. Uh, just a couple of examples, um, there was a huge dispute in some of the territories whether anonymous whistleblowing signals should be allowed or not, uh, simply because the directive provided the freedom to the territories to decide on that. Um, there was an interesting dispute in Germany about the potential conflict of interest, employers versus uh, NGOs, uh, and, and many other reasons why some of the territories are moving really slow. Uh, and last but not least, um, you might be surprised, but some of the territories in the European Union did have in place some sort of legislation regulating whistleblowing. And for them, it seems to be a bit more difficult to adopt an existing legislation uh, to the terms and conditions set by the directive, rather than just doing um, a new legislation from scratch. Um, and as you can see, Hungary is one of these territories, and I would assume one of the arguments is that they have good enough law, and knowing what the current Hungarian government thinks about the European Union bureaucracy, uh, we might not be surprised that they will not adopt the directive very soon. Uh, next slide, please. Now, um, what is important and why we talk about the whistleblower protection uh, here? Um, it's a very important to say that there are a lot of there is a lot of legacy in, in the Bulgarian uh, mindset uh, when we talk about whistleblowing, uh, but it's something different to what we used to be uh, fond of during the socialist time. 
Uh, so it's nothing to do with spying, nothing to do with reporting. It's much more increasing the importance of the corporate interest when you talk about uh, internal whistleblowing and also the general interest of the society. And therefore the directive clearly identifies three possible channels or three possible ways of, of whistleblowing whenever a breach of, of EU legislation has been identified. And uh, I, I would much more focus on, on these 20 minutes I have today on the internal one, which in fact encourages people to report breaches uh, within the companies or within the public authorities, because that's important to underline that the directive is applicable not only to private businesses, but also to public authorities uh, via a special internal channel. Um, and this, this signal should be addressed uh, effectively internally. And, and that's why we say that this directive is providing a great opportunity for increasing the corporate culture and the corporate transparency, uh, something that we still need to work on in Bulgaria, for example. The external whistleblowing channel is something which we're used to. It's simply uh, notifying a competent authority in, in the respective EU member state, uh, whether either there was an internal reporting and there was no uh, proper feedback or there was no reaction, or you just decide to go straight to uh, the state authorities or the, the local authorities uh, without uh, doing prior internal reporting. And, and finally, which is uh, also a very common uh, way of whistleblowing in, in Bulgaria in particular, this is the, the, the public disclosure or the media channel. And again, uh, the directive provides the liberty to um, people to decide whether they want to exercise this option as the last possible one, or they, they may go directly straight to it. Uh, in any case, there should be reasonable grounds to believe that there is a breach of uh, the EU legislation and it that um, causes a danger to the public interest. So in other words, the whistleblowing protection is not pretending private, but public interest, and it should be real impact on the society of this breach of legislation that has been identified uh, by an individual. Uh, next slide, please. Now, a couple of words about the so-called material scope of the directive. Um, as you can see, there are 12 areas of uh, public interest, which the directive believes that are of utmost importance. And therefore protection for potential whistleblowers is granted only if they are related to any of these 12 areas. So being either public procurement or product safety and compliance, transportation safety, et cetera. Uh, you see all of them here. Um, this is important to pay attention to because up to now, uh, mainly uh, companies in the financial services sector were uh, very much into the whistleblowing arrangement uh, just because they had regulations in place where they had to report any breaches, uh, either in case of any money laundering violations or um, terrorist financing or anything of a kind. Uh, but as you can see, the, the range of, uh, of EU law breaches has been extended uh, to much more areas which are public interest. And what about the, who, uh, from personal perspective, uh, this would apply to? Uh, maybe, Ellie, you can move two slides forward. Yeah. Um, and, and this is one of the interesting uh, areas where there, are, there were a lot of debates uh, in, in the majority of the territories in the European Union when they were implementing, as well as during the uh, public uh, discussion, which the Ministry of Justice of Bulgaria undertook back in October 2021. Um, and this is a, a very hot uh, topic, which uh, it's really important how it would be resolved, how it will be regulated. And to the extent that the draft legislation is still not completed and still not brought to the parliament for discussion and voting there, um, there, there are a lot of interest to uh, have an, a bit of an impact on, on this one. Uh, why is it so important? The, the European legislator has provided quite a bit of a range of a uh, group of people that may be whistleblowers and they can claim protection uh, after performing whistleblowing. 
um, simply because in the private sector, this, not, this does not apply only to the current employees of the companies, but also to former ones. And, and, and in this direction, there is an interesting provision in, in the draft law prepared in Bulgaria, uh, where there is a term of limitation up to 12 months uh, after the person leaves the company, he may whistleblow about um, law breaches. Um, the directive also provides the opportunity for the EU member states to um, bring into the scope of the directive also part-time workers, uh, fixed-term contractors, temporary workers, but also self-employed individuals, shareholders and members of the administrative and management bodies uh, of any undertaking, including non-executive ones. Uh, as well as uh, volunteers, uh, paid or unpaid trainees. The most interesting group of potential uh, people who can claim protection under the directive and then respectively the national legislation is the group provided under the directive uh, being classified as people working under the supervision and direction of contractors, subcontractors and suppliers. And talking to uh, some of our clients, we have already seen how this provision is making some of them quite nervous, uh, particularly in, in businesses where there are a lot of suppliers, where there is a lot of interaction in the supply chain. Uh, some of the companies do not feel comfortable, either because they don't have uh, still very strong code of conduct in place, or for some legacy reasons, they are slightly um, reluctant to provide so much power in the hands of their suppliers that uh, I've already read some opinions that this should not be allowed in Bulgaria, uh, which is something that we need to follow uh, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, next slide, Eli. Now, um, what does the protection of whistleblowers mean? Um, there are three main groups of protection measures uh, established under the directive. Uh, which are summarized on this slide. So this is prohibition of retaliation, measures of support, and measures for protecting against uh, retaliation. Um, may, many of you may have heard different stories about um, cases of breach of ethical codes, internal ethical codes, but obviously um, this directive is moving much, much ahead of just um, pure ethical norms. It's really um, acts and or misconducts related to breaches of, of really important uh, pieces of legislation, which has material public interest and impact. Um, some of them already being mentioned like uh, safety, uh, data privacy and data protection, cybersecurity, uh, you name it. And therefore, um, any, any such breaches uh, really would cause the people to be more brave, stand up and, and, and raise their voice. Uh, hopefully first internally and, and the management of the company would listen to them uh, and make uh, actions. Uh, or if the people decide they may go directly and, and use the external channel or just go to public disclosure. Now, what, what is the difference? And, um, why it's important to say to talk about this one compared to the existing practices. Um, many of you have heard a lot of stories where people have complained about misconduct, primarily of public authorities, but also private businesses, uh, being raised uh, by external channels to public authorities or regulatory bodies, and, and no reaction uh, following after it. Now the directive imposes certain deadlines and probably that's one of the major differences which give more power to the people who have um, acted as whistleblowers. Uh, in the case of the internal channels, um, number one, uh, there is a deadline within which the internal uh, channel recipient should confirm the receipt of the signal. And there is a fixed deadline, which is up to three months uh, where there should be a clear decision or resolution what has been done uh, after receiving the signal and what reaction has been made as a result of that. Uh, and, and this is one of the, the clear um, differentiators compared to any existing practices we have in place. We used to say that many of the terms fixed uh, under Bulgarian law were rather instructive, that mandatory. Uh, I think that the non-compliance here might trigger 
uh, penalties for uh, the company's management or the public authorities which have been uh, receiving such signals. And also the fact that we might allow in Bulgaria to increase uh, the scope, the personal scope, um, that may also be um, really interesting to see how this would be reacted. Um, it's also important to mention that there is a, a huge dispute uh, going on in Bulgaria as to whether the Bulgarian uh, regulators should allow anonymous uh, whistleblowing. And surprisingly or not, it seems that we have the two extremes. There are people who say, yes, definitely we should go for it. And there are people who are very much afraid of that. Uh, nevertheless, the, the directive has established certain rules if an anonymous whistleblowing is allowed, because that's up to the territories to decide, um, there are certain measures which provide for um, the uh, recipient of the signal to make sure that there, there are no privacy rules being uh, are brought uh, and, and that the personal information and the privacy of the information uh, about the whistleblower and, and the related data in the signal uh, are well protected in accordance with the GDPR requirements. Ellie, can we move to the next one? Now, one of the questions that the legislation that the draft law in Bulgaria still does not clearly give guidance on is who can be the whistleblowing dedicated person? Um, the legal requirements in the draft law has not been said yet. Um, some of the best examples we have seen in the, in the EU member states, which have already implemented the directive, are that it's really strongly uh, recommendable that this is uh, an individual who is fully mature, uh, with good professional and ethical standing, who is a trustworthy person. And then we see a variety of possible function uh, within a corporate uh, organization uh, who can actually perform um, this duty. It may be either an existing compliance officer, um, an ombudsman, which is a very rare figure uh, under Bulgarian corporate um, system. It, this might be a security officer in the company, it might be the secretary of the board or directors. Um, if there are ethical committees, it might be one of, of, of the members of it. Obviously, the legal counselor is, is one of the preferred options. And last but not least, to combine the regulatory uh, affairs, uh, potentially the data protection officer who's been appointed to be responsible for the implementation of GDPR might play this role as well. Next one. Um, two important deadlines. Um, the first one, the directive is in place, nevertheless, has not been fully transpositioned, and companies with more than 250 employees uh, should apply it as of January this year. Or at least they may uh, rely and, and, and refer to the directive, uh, although we don't have the, uh, the law transposition. Um, there is a second uh, milestone, uh, which is set for January 2024. And this applies to uh, companies and public organizations with uh, 50 plus employees. Um, there, there is a, a dispute still going on whether Bulgaria should follow the example of some of the uh, Central and East European nations, which are rather considering lowering this, this threshold. I mean, for example, the Czech draft legislation envisages that the second threshold should be 25 plus, which, as you would imagine, would increase dramatically the number of companies which we are obliged to apply it. And, and establish an internal uh, channel of whistleblowing. Uh, but although many of the companies have to face the compliance with the directive as of 2024, it's, it's really important to start as early as possible uh, because as you would see, there are quite a lot of actions that in, any company should undertake. And um, I've already heard the voice of many employers um, raising a noise that it's, it's another administrative burden for them, that they need to spend money on this. And um, the, the good answer to these comments would be, uh, you better start earlier in order to be well prepared in, in order to spend less money and to have a really a, a better impact and effect of implementing the directive. 
And uh, why is that uh, important? Um, for large organizations, even with just a couple of hundred people, uh, if they decide which whistleblowing system they would like to implement, and there are plenty on the market, um, sometimes it would take some time to implement it properly. And I would say usually it will be up to six months to make things really up and running. And for those which are 250 plus, um, they're already late just because the directive is in place. Those with a smaller numbers, they, they can just do that and start preparing for 2024 upfront. Um, secondly, um, the, this, this legislation is imposing uh, quite of a number of important obligations, uh, which are related to ensuring uh, the protection of identity of the whistleblowers, uh, the obligation to have a designated person, uh, and sometimes it's not easy to pick up the right one. Um, then there is a processing and managing um, the, the information which flows through the internal channels. So all that does require certain time and efforts and uh, starting timely preparation would become extremely important. Um, I know that uh, some of our colleagues have already started working uh, with their clients on developing uh, or just reviewing the existing policies uh, or drafting new ones. But uh, this is not just a check the book exercise. And um, compared to GDPR, there wouldn't be that much of administrative pressure by the government. It's much more um, reaction of penalties that may happen, but these would be really severe. And, and this is another area to see how the Bulgarian uh, legislator will decide to go for. Uh, because for example, um, protecting the whistleblowers, the Czech Republic is imposing really material sanctions which may end up in uh, two annual salaries of the employee if he, has, he or she has suffered uh, from submitting a signal uh, for any breaches of legislation. Ellie, the last one, I think, is the next one. Yeah, um, just uh, you know, for the sake of time, I, I will stop here. Um, three business models have been recognized as uh, being appropriate uh, you can either choose to have a complete in-house function dealing with uh, whistleblowing. Um, if you believe that you have the right structure, the right people and the right preparation, or if you're part of a group, a corporate group that really pays a lot of attention uh, on, on corporate compliance and, and transparency and corporate culture really means something. Uh, you may consider core sourcing, just combining functions uh, with uh, people who are doing um, other important tasks. So as I mentioned, for example, um, the, the DPOs might be a good solution. And last but not least, um, a lot of the larger corporations, and in fact, considering outsourcing, uh, just for the sake of securing um, that they're fully compliant, engaging professional uh, suppliers, or um, using a, a very advanced technology, um, which really would save them money because the truth is that even though it may look like it's administrative burden and it's some extra charges, particularly for the smaller businesses, at the end of the day, companies that apply properly, uh, the whistleblowing internal channels, they realize very soon that the effectiveness of their people increases, uh, that they are lowering their administrative costs of potential disputes. Um, and obviously there are benefits which comes with a couple of years. Um, I know that we are running out of time, so I would really would like to stop here. And if there are any questions, happy to address them now, or uh, anyone can, uh, yeah, th th this was just a slide with a number of important um, ICO standards, uh, which you might consider, but again, um, it's really for those who are fond of, of being really 100% compliant. So not, not mandatory, just best practices. Thank you very much, uh, Yuli, for going quickly through the presentation. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A section. Uh, do you have a toolkit for compliance and really have further webinars on how to react? Um, if you ask particularly about PwC, yes, we have our own tool, and also we have an alliance with some of the major suppliers on the market. Uh, I wouldn't mention any names, not to advertise, but anyone interested, happy to discuss further on 
uh, what uh, could be provided and which one is better and what for. Um, the Bulgarian draft legislation is not available yet. Don't ask me why. Um, that some sort of a draft was available when the discussion was going on in, in October. The, the, the most recent information I have received last week was that uh, the Minister of Justice is, is putting pressure on her team um, to get the draft law finalized pretty soon. Um, the Minister Yordanova is, is a person who definitely doesn't want Bulgaria to be penalized for not being compliant with the uh, transposition of EU directives. So as far as I understood, uh, she has provided guidance to her teams in the ministry really to speed up the process. Um, so I, I do hope that in the coming weeks, probably we should see the final draft before going to the parliament. Thank you so much for, for your um, short presentation on, uh, on the big topic. Uh, and uh, I'm sure our attendees will have more questions. You can see uh, Julian's uh, contact details. So if you have uh, any more questions, please do not hesitate to contact him directly or through BBVA. Thank you, Yuli. So let's move forward to the fourth important presentation in, um, in our busy agenda today. And it is again focused uh, on uh, UK and Bulgaria relationships. Uh, and this is cross-border disputes involving the UK and Bulgaria. I would like to invite uh, Carmen Shorlev, uh, who is the managing partner for New Balkans Law Office uh, to briefly walk us through the subject. Carmen, the floor is yours. And, and um, uh, I will um, uh, need to make a couple of, uh, of reservations. One is that you will um, see um, a presentation with approximately 19 slides. And um, in the interests of time, I will focus more on some of them and less on others. Um, but I was hoping that uh, you may be able to, even if you're not walked through some of them, you may still find them useful um, as, as a point of uh, departure or in order to uh, ask questions. The other reservation is that unfortunately, um, I'm having to um, somewhat juggle um, and am therefore currently in a location outside my office and uh, will not um, show video of myself, but uh, will be uh, will be glad if, if that means you can focus more on what I have to say uh, and or on the presentation in front of you. The topic is, is obviously extremely broad, um, and it's also a topic that um, most uh, business people are hoping um, that they do not uh, have to confront very frequently, and indeed some, uh, some of them manage to avoid uh, doing so for um, their entire business careers or almost so, whereas in certain other, in certain sectors, it may in fact be um, something that happens regularly. And therefore, um, this will be a question and, and perhaps we can um, go through the second slide, which um, shows uh, some brief information uh, on the team. Um, we, we do deal with um, disputes on a weekly, if not at our firm, and, and we are very much cross-jurisdictional between the two countries, um, both myself and, and my colleagues. Some points from our uh, practice and experience, particularly over the, the last year or so uh, later on. And perhaps if we then uh, move on to slide four, um, I will um, briefly summarize what I will, will cover today. As mentioned, this is a topic that for some of you is very familiar and for others less uh, so, and you hope it won't be, but I think uh, an overview is, is helpful. And this is the purpose of, of today's talk. Um, the big, Uh, both in terms of anticipation of um, uh, Brexit day and then uh, the date of the end of the, the transition period uh, was connected with um, Brexit to cross-border disputes. Um, 
um, hopefully as I speak, that, that um, the significance of Brexit is huge because primarily it shifts uh, from being an intra-European one um, in relation to disputes to being a, 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 an entirely non-European one with, with some residual exceptions, um, which changes uh, things both in relation to the UK and in relation to Bulgaria. So um, those consequences will be, will be hopefully Uh, coming, Basic sorry questions. for coming. Uh, apologies for the interruption. From time to time, we are losing the sound. So, if you could stay closer to your microphone, that will be appreciated. Tell me. Go ahead. Um, is this any better? That's much better. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Apologies. Okay try something again could you can you hear me okay at the moment yes we can hear you fine thank you great um so um uh please do let me know if there are interruptions and my my apologies for this so um the the basic questions that one asks um uh in relation to a dispute of course are um when that arises are uh what is the governing law of that dispute um, where can proceedings be, be started? Is this a piece of litigation or is it, um, is it a case that the parties have agreed, in fact, to arbitrate? Um, I will not deal uh, at all extensively with arbitration today, but primarily with contexts of, of litigation. Um, once there is either an arbitral award um, or uh, th there is a judgment of whatever kind in uh, litigation proceedings, then how does that get enforced where it needs to be enforced, either in order to secure assets and payment of a judgment sum, or perhaps uh, in order to secure some, some other uh, type uh, of remedy. Although, as uh, you will see, those other types of remedies are now unfortunately much more limited post-Brexit. Um, there are uh, on the way, there are ancillary questions, such as, for example, service and how to insure it. Um, and uh, questions about evidence and, and how to obtain it, for example. Um, what I won't cover are issues that are beyond commercial, the commercial and civil ones, uh, although they may be related to some, of, uh, some commercial clients um, may have those issues, they may interface with commercial issues that, that are dealt with, such as employment or even consumer and family matters, um, but they're not something I will focus on. And finally, um, even though um, this is a UK, a very much a UK um, and uh, Bulgaria uh, business association, um, obviously there are at least um, three jurisdictions within the UK and Scotland and Northern Ireland are separate to England and Wales, which is, which is a unitary jurisdiction for legal purposes. And therefore, um, therefore I will mainly be or only be speaking about England. So with all of these prefaces, um, I think um, I, I can safely move on to, to um, the question of um, how does one establish um, jurisdiction? Um, I mentioned earlier that the end of the transition period was uh, at uh, 11 p.m. Uh, on the 31st of December 2020 it was a, a key point in time because prior to that, the so-called European regime applied. Um, and then beyond that date, uh, what, applied, uh, what applies uh, uh, is, is much less certain. Um, so uh, prior to that date, there were clear rules on jurisdiction, um, which were dealt with in the European regulation. And after that date, um, each of England and Wales on the one hand and Bulgaria has its own uh, rules that generally apply, unless um, in, in the usual case, uh, the, the only exception to that between Bulgaria and the UK um, is a Hague Convention, um, which um, applies, uh, which is in, in force um, since shortly after 2005. Um, in fact, actually a little bit longer than 2005 in 2015. Um, and uh, that Hague Convention shouldn't be confused with other Hague Conventions, such as on service, for example, 1965. Um, and this 2005 Hague Convention deals only 
or primarily with the situation where two usually commercial parties have reached uh, an agreement, uh, usually in writing in their contract, on what is the, the law um, that, uh, that they are choosing and also what jurisdiction they're choosing. And when they do so, and when their agreement is an exclusive choice of law, so only exclusively, for example, English law will apply, or only exclusively Bulgarian law will apply, etc., then that choice is something that the convention will put into effect. In the situation where perhaps um, that choice is non-exclusive, which are quite common, or in situations where the choice is uh, even asymmetric, um, so one party can exclusively sue in the courts of X, but the other party can choose whether it's used in the courts of X or Y, um, then it would appear that the Hague 2005 convention doesn't apply. Um, and um, so this is a, a useful instrument because it allows one to establish jurisdiction in the courts of respectively Bulgaria, or England and Wales, etc. But um, it requires the parties to go through that process of having pre-agreed um, the choice of law. Um, you will be all thinking that this is very similar to the situation that, that, that parties should be so forward-looking generally, and it's very similar to the situation where uh, uh, there is an arbitration clause. Um, I will not say more for now on the 2005 Hague Convention. Um, in relation to um, the uh, traditional rules in England and Wales, um, those generally speaking, may be put in two buckets. Um, so if, you, if you're looking to establish jurisdiction in England, uh, you broadly need to show so-called foreign convenience or rather that non-convenience doesn't apply, or you need to find the defendants that you're looking to see you in, in the jurisdiction and serve them. And that personal service uh, is, uh, is quite enough to establish jurisdiction in the eyes of the English courts. Alternatively, if you're not serving them in England, uh, you would want to serve them abroad and then you need uh, a permission. And so we can move on to slide the next slide, um, litigation three. Uh, and that's just to say that um, there are a number of gateways in the civil procedure rules of England and Wales, which govern situations in which the English courts will um, either as of right in some cases or um, by main, means of an order specifically allow service uh, overseas. Um, and when they do allow such, um, then that, that would establish um, jurisdiction. Um, the, uh, therefore, again, the conclusion would be that in general, it's a very good idea to either use an arbitration clause or to use an exclusive um, choice of law uh, agreements such that the Hague Convention applies because um, otherwise complexity would, would ensue. Um, once service is ordered, it's very important for service to be done um, properly. And it's also important to keep in mind that it may take uh, quite a long time. And that time might be between four and 12 months. And it involves multiple um, government uh, officials in both the sending and receiving, transmitting and receiving countries. Um, one other um, important idea is to uh, implement an agent uh, for service of process clause in your agreement on top of your choice of law, um, such that um, hopefully that will mean that, that you can um, contractually circumvent the otherwise more cumbersome process of service. And perhaps moving on to the next slide. Um, the point of this slide, it's, it's um, headed securing assets. And really the idea is um, the following, that when you start proceedings uh, or you even before you have issued proceedings in the case of both Bulgaria and England, it is a good idea if you suspect that um, your opponent will be looking to dissipate um, their assets and not um, not permit you in the in the event of success to satisfy your judgment against them. It's a great idea um, to perhaps even surprise them and um, within the limits of 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 um, 
what is called in, at least in traditionally in English um, cases, the nuclear option of a freezing order. Um, so that option is supposed to be quite rarely accessible and thus nuclear. The Bulgarian courts seem to be in one sense more, uh, more trigger happy for domestic purposes, but they are very timid as I've written on this slide when it comes to uh, international um, injunctions. Um, they, they don't have enough experience in that regard. And even within the European context, they're reluctant, but, um, but they're very, very happy to do it for assets situated within Bulgaria. Whereas conversely, the English courts are generally much more nuanced, um, but they are, um, they are uh, uh, much happier to, to uh, order um, a worldwide freezing order, for example. However, post um, the end of the transition period again, um, there is a significant complexity here um, in terms of enforcing fresh orders that arise uh, after that date, as opposed to orders in proceedings which started before the transition period ended. So for any proceedings that are still going on and started before the end of 2020, um, the situation is under old European rules. Uh, potentially even if the order, the freezing order is issued after that date. So if we can perhaps move on to the next slide. Um, the, um, I will only briefly say that, um, that there are um, international uh, rules in terms of uh, attempting to secure evidence, but to a large degree, one is left to the domestic means of securing uh, evidence. I'm afraid in the interests of time, I won't deal with either this slide or uh, the next slide, um, but the key point here is uh, letters of request. And um, moving on to, uh, to the next um, slide eight, um, the question is uh, one of um, what do you do once you have a judgment? And by judgment here, we, uh, we can think of either um, a judgment for, for a final sum of money uh, or uh, perhaps for, for, for another um, order. Historically, and, and still for cases started before the end of 2020, um, other types of orders would have been much more easily enforceable between Bulgaria and the UK. Um, at the moment, uh, in order to enforce a uh, English order that isn't for a sum of money, um, there are a variety of additional requirements which uh, need to be looked at, such as, for example, um, the question of, um, of whether it will be contrary to public order in Bulgaria uh, if you're enforcing, a, let's say, an, a permanent injunction in Bulgaria. But as regards sums of money, um, uh, the position in England, so enforcing a Bulgarian judgment in England, is that one needs to sue as if from scratch on, uh, on the foreign judgment, treating such judgments um, within certain limits as merely um, a contractual agreement to pay, almost as if it's a contractual agreement to pay a sum of money and then suing on that as if it's a debt, which is a sort of legal fiction that com the common law has applied. Um, the um, uh, that process then can be followed by a summary judgment to be obtained, uh, perhaps in England typically, uh, and then enforcement can proceed. For certain purposes, in order to establish merely that you um, that a certain issue has been litigated, that it has already been dealt with either as a defense or as a claim, it's not necessary to obtain enforcement, of course. Um, but it will uh, still be um, desirable to obtain recognition, and uh, there is a process for that. Um, perhaps I should check with you how many more minutes I have, if any. Uh, we are running a little bit late, so uh, if you could wrap up in about five minutes, that will be great. Great. Um, thank you. So... Um, Perhaps I will um, move us um, along to, um, uh, to slide uh, litigation nine very quickly. Um, this is the idea that um, it was previously possible 
to avoid situations very easily possible to avoid situations where there were multiple proceedings going on on the same subject matter in both uh, Bulgaria and uh, elsewhere, such as, for example, England and Wales. Um, that's now become actually much easier for there to be such multiple proceedings. Um, and uh, it is possible to obtain anti-suit injunctions in England uh, to prevent um, parties from, or to attempt to prevent parties from starting or continuing proceedings elsewhere. Um, and it will be a question of, of attempting to enforce those injunctions um, wherever those parties are, or their assets are. Um, and uh, it isn't possible, generally speaking, to obtain such anti-suit injunctions in Bulgaria, but there may be other means of dealing with multiple proceedings going on at the same time. Um, on the next slide, um, the idea is to mention that, uh, generally speaking, um, the, the rules have not changed by Brexit too much in that uh, in litigation in the courts of, of a relevant country, you can generally only be uh, represented by lawyers from that country. Um, and um, that may be something that you factor in um, in terms of the differential fee rates and, and the total cost of litigation uh, when you decide on what should be the governing law and whether you should be using arbitration or litigation. Um, proceedings in the English courts have a reputation for being very international, very fair, uh, very resulting in, in judgments that are very well um, uh, presented and, and reasoned. Um, but uh, the problem uh, may be that, that the typical amount of fees, uh, particularly legal fees as opposed to court fees, can be quite substantial. And uh, the average sum uh, for a high court um, proceeding, I think uh, a few years ago, was recorded as being in the uh, region of 170,000 pounds of fees. Um, and so that's something to be uh, considered. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, at this um, slide raises the question of what's, what uh, rights have disappeared with Brexit. And um, some of them have not, again, completely disappeared, simply um, are phasing themselves out. Um, and so, for example, uh, the European Small Claims proceeding, Procedures and uh, European Orders for Payment um, started before um, the 31st of December 2020 are still uh, enforceable and allowed to run. But the question will be if a certain order is, there, there are some issues in relation to serving such orders uh, on uh, the foreign courts of the former fellow member states. So Bulgarian European orders for payment served in England after the end of the transition period appear to be in fact unenforceable, even though they are uh, valid or at least unenforceable in the way that the European order for, for payment uh, regulation uh, envisaged. And um, so there are certainly fine points for, for um, such uh, types of procedures that were in flight at the relevant time of Brexit, but in relation to it going forward, they, they won't broadly be available. And also, of course, um, preliminary references to the European courts um, are out. Um, but there may be um, other new possibilities that, that are in, such as, for example, the anti-suit injunction. And then I thought it will be, moving on to the next slide, I thought it will be um, curious um, to check what kind of decisions mention um, the word Bulgaria or Bulgarian and are reported in English courts. Um, there have historically been a number of such cases, although Bulgaria hasn't generated as much as perhaps other East European countries, and of course, famously, um, Russian-speaking parties and Russians um, practically occupy um, the High Court in London. But um, when it comes to Bulgaria, there's a few historical cases that are quite interesting. Um, for example, the Barbudev decision um, of 2006, which dealt with um, several complex um, documents that parties had executed in a, um, a, in a corporate uh, transaction in, in the sale of an interest uh, in a group of cable companies. And that's a decision that's frequently cited, uh, in fact, 
um, and it dealt with um, the topic of uh, whether there's uh, a contract, uh, broadly speaking, or an agreement to agree, which is which is not, um, in fact, enforceable in English law. But uh, more recently, there haven't been um, well-known commercial parties um, whose uh, cases have become public and reported. Most of the Bulgarian references relate to topics which we said are not of interest to us today, such as extradition, family law, um, references to the European Court of Human Rights and uh, older European Union law decisions. Um, interestingly, because of the widespread use of English companies and the very different uh, provisions which English insolvency law um, tends to offer compared to Bulgarian law, there may well be in the English courts a number of uh, proceedings that involve Bulgarian assets held through um, holding English companies that are going through insolvency, uh, and that will result in some very interesting case law. But um, perhaps um, one such case is Bullsatcom, which is, uh, which is going through the courts um, at the moment in terms of a restructuring of that company. Um, and and um, in the Bulgarian courts, conversely, and if we move on to the next slide, what's been, um, what's been uh, referred to in terms of Great Britain or the UK over the last year has involved mainly issues on the service of proceedings and, and these proceedings such as the uh, Bulgarian orders for payment and um, issues about service on parties who declare their address to be uh, not in Bulgaria anymore but in the UK and how the Bulgarian courts deal with that question. Um, at our firm, we have um, um, continued to deal, as I say, with quite a quite a workload of, of cases between the two jurisdictions. Uh, and when it comes to enforcement, that's raised uh, a number of very interesting questions, uh, which we've been dealing with over the last year. Um, and then perhaps moving on to the next slide, this was just my point about arbitration. Um, the two countries offer both um, different but both strong traditions in arbitration. Arbitration in Bulgaria has been given a slightly uh, less, um, uh, less perhaps um, well sounding a name in, in recent years, but for some, um, for some reason, um, arbitration in England tends to not suffer from that kind of um, less good reputation. But in fact, both are highly appropriate um, means of preventing the um, disputes from arising or when arising for, from, for resolving them. Um, and they have the benefit of um, usually much better enforcement. And seats, of course, in Bulgaria of uh, arbitration in Sofia typically is the BCCI, the Bulgarian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And of course, in London, in addition to ad hoc arbitrations, there are there is the LCIA, which is a well-known institution. Um, and with that, uh, I hope this was useful um, as a very quick flight. And I hope that the um, sound effects were, uh, uh, were uh, of the right kind that you could hear me most of the time and, and um, uh, clearly so. Thank you very much for coming. Yes, the sound was uh, perfect. So thank you for really walking us through a very important and uh, uh, deep topic quite quickly and uh, all the participants can see your contact details on the screen. I don't see any questions in the Q&A section right away, uh, but uh, I would invite our participants to contact you on your email and telephone numbers that they can see on the screen. Thank and, you. Uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Appreciate that. Thank you, Carmen. And without further ado, I would like to move forward as we have two more very important topics uh, to cover and uh, thank you uh, to all uh, our participants who are uh, staying with us uh, to go through the whole program which is as usual quite busy and i would like to give the floor to richard Kleck from um, Volftais to give us an overview of um, ip focus on uk us venture capital in bulgaria richard the floor is yours Uh, I'm afraid we cannot hear you. Are you on mute by any chance? How's that? There you go. That's perfect. Uh, so just saying, first of all, thank you very much for staying with us on this snowy afternoon. Uh, much, much appreciated. Um, so 
if you just go to the next slide, please. So um, I'm, I wanted to talk today about venture capital and as a private equity and to bridge some of the expectations between uh, what investors are looking for and some of the issues you find here. Um, obviously, there is lots of venture capital in the market, um, but I wanted specifically to look at it from the angle of US, UK. Um, we wolf ties do somewhere around 40 uh, sort of transactions every, every year of sort of different sizes. And what we found is that particularly since the Biden um, administration came in, there's been a wave of sort of US investment. So we've had um, a, a sort of significantly more US venture capital, US private equity coming in, either um, acquiring the Bulgarian companies directly or more commonly where the Bulgarian company is part of a larger group. Um, and it's always interesting when you see these waves of investment coming from different parts of the world um, to see the expectations that the investor has. And uh, so particularly for the US, um, still today, frequently, it's often the first time that this US uh, fund is is doing a um, sort of transaction within Eastern Europe. And of course, very often the first time that they're doing a deal here. So I just want to kick off by uh, setting the difference between venture capital, private equity, because they are terms which are used interchangeably. Um, and the core difference between them perhaps relates around um, as a control. So venture capital is um, more sort of growth equity. So you often find two or three funds entering into a transaction at the same time. And the purpose is to take a relatively early stage company to a much larger transaction. Um, so venture capital investors are really focused upon the value of that uh, company. They're not so much concerned about the daily management. So the things that they're looking for are valuation protection in the shares, preferred stock, restricted stock, stock anti-dilution, liquidation preferences, and they're looking for uh, exit rights so that they have the right to, to sort of recover um, the, uh, the income which they wish to, to sort of generate. A term that underlined is uh, intellectual property contribution. And of course, venture capital deals a lot with uh, sort of technology companies. And in the US, and really the essence of this slide back today is that in the US and in the UK, it's possible to sell and transfer intellectual property copyright over software. And that's not the case here. And so quite often there's a very initial shock for US investors uh, where the, the Bulgarian target company doesn't necessarily own all of the intellectual property. Private equity, just turning to it, as I say, the sort of significant difference is that they're generally looking for a, as a majority control, so over 50%, and they're looking for daily operational involvement. So you often find the seller, the founder, keeping a smaller position, staying on board and uh, being incentivized. But fundamentally, the private equity group uh, may have um, other investments in the same sector and wants to leverage that to build up, to increase the profit margin and then to exit. So venture capital will be looking at valuation, the enterprise value, private equity on a sort of transaction level, uh, looking at um, operational um, input. So to turn to the next slide, if I may. Um, so here's a typical intellectual property journey for a, a Bulgarian uh, company or even a CE company. And we see this very often, this, this, uh, this sort of journey. So often uh, you see a company which has been um, established by a founder, the founder um, had the idea for the company often when they were previously employed and they started doing some software development by themselves, maybe with a colleague and friends to do a proof of concept to, you know, test and experiment. And it was only after a while that they decided to set up first company. And typically, of course, it's a um, limited liability company. And probably more often than not, they, they establish with a founder, partner, or with several founder partners. 
at that point, in order to develop, they put some money together and they take on the first employees. But of course, there's limited funds. And so not all of the uh, developers working will be full time employees. They're often using self employed, um, other um, 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 support. And frequently, of course, uh, developers are building upon open source software or other software which is licensed. So that's very much the early, early stages. When it gets to uh, the first year or two and as commercialization, um, I would say quite often we see founder separation. So the product has gone in a different direction. One, one founder says, actually, I have to take the business this way. The other one maybe a, a different way. So you often see the history of a company. There's been a change of shareholders at some point, a change in the business as the uh, product has been adjusted. And of course, what that means is that there's been a separation, a separation of the entity, potentially a separation of the developers, a separation of the software. You also find the first international um, uh, sort of setups, mainly for sales. And of course, it's still very common that um, you have the sort of development work, the management here, but your customers for software will be in Western Europe, US, elsewhere. So you see sales offices um, sort of being established uh, and then you know, pre-sales, post-sales support. And as the company grows, you're not going to do all of the development in-house, but you'll be out as um, sourcing it. So now there are contracts with other development companies, some of them here, some of them in other 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 sort of countries, and we get then to the sort of growth to the venture capital transaction. Um, so you know, for us, I guess typically um, we're getting involved when the venture capital tickets, you know, between five, seven, ten, ten million ish. So at that point, uh, the company already has multiple offices, both for software development and for sales. It's employing people with different nationalities. Um, and, you know, now you have a pretty well-established business and you open the books to the venture capital investor who wants to do a sort of diligence. So moving to the next slide, Desi. Um, so that's the journey. And just to then take a breath and flick through what's the Bulgarian position for intellectual property. Um, so one difference particularly for uk us compared to continental europe bulgaria is that you um can't patent software very easily uh, you can if the software is integrated into um a hardware product uh, but you know commonly it's just subject to um sort of copyright protection and copyright protection is also uh, mixed. So the, found, the, the original uh, developer, the author, has uh, some moral rights, but they also have rights in, for example, uh, manuals and these are materials. And depending on the, the employment contract, depending on the contract with the uh, third party, copyright may vest either with the developer or with the company. And of course, we all know this and companies know this, but going back to the early days of that journey, where the companies focused upon developing and testing R&D, uh, very often the sort of documentation around it, you know, wasn't the top as a priority. Um, copyrights under Bulgarian law also cannot be sold, and this is a, a big difference for UK, US. Um, and even after explaining it and being on multiple conference calls with uh, sort of potential investors, this is still something which comes up weeks later into a sort of transaction. And the US venture capital fund says, but of course, we do want the IP to be transferred to the company. And you, you go back again over, the, over how that's going to happen. So under Bulgarian law, uh, you can't sell copyright, but you can license it. And it's for a maximum of 10 years. You can sort of renew, and there are different mechanisms to sort of renew that, but you can't have a license which is a sort of perpetual. So it's 10 years with a mechanism for extension. Um, as I mentioned, quite often uh, companies are using open source software, um, and particularly for the US. Uh, in, in, in investors, less so for the uh, European investors. Um, 
there'll be a lot of diligence around what open source software has been used. The expectation is that there's a, a very clear list of what was done uh, and the US diligence will have a separate open source diligence stream where they will go through what rights does the company have to use that open source software. And of course, one uh, topic is that if there's a what's called a as a copyleft clause, it may create limits on any improvements and sort of derivative works which have been undertaken. The companies need to be very good in keeping a record of, of what open source they have used. Coming on to the individuals who are uh, in company founders, employees and third party contractors. So I've mentioned here, you know, copyright cannot be sold by the founder to the company, cannot be transferred. Um, but as importantly, and uh, so particularly for the US again, if the founder was employed by his previous employer at the time that the first coding and the first source code was being developed, there is a possibility that copyright could vest with the ex-employer. Um, it's something which I think probably many uh, founders here do not consider, and it's something which European investors up until now maybe haven't had at the top of their list. But with the US, you see a very uh, close attention on what was the previous employment contract that the founder had with his previous company um, to make sure that there's no copyright uh, vested elsewhere. With employees, um, it's really a case of a sort of documentation. Um, so in principle, um, any software developed by an employee for his employer vests with the employer, um, but um, you do need to draft the contract correctly in order to make sure that you're capturing all of the uh, development work. And uh, so particularly if the employee was first employed to work on one project, and then moves to another, the employment contract should be um, sort of adjusted to take into account that there's this new project. Um, when it comes to uh, group use, I mentioned all the different companies. Um, as the group starts using uh, software, then that needs to be licensed around the group. And then finally, with the corporate transformations mentioning founders leaving, uh, you need to take care uh, just to understand what happened to copyright in a sale, a spin-off, a sale of a going concern, um, etc. So to the next slide, um, what does that mean with our journey? So what it means is that at the very early stages of a, of a diligence, at the very early stages of these of discussions with a US-UK investor, I think founders need to be very open um, and need to have a clear understanding themselves of the IP. And the reason for that is that if you start the process by saying, yes, we own all of the IP, we're very confident we own it. And as the due diligence starts, there's this issue and another issue and another issue, it starts to create a lack of trust in the company and a, and a lack of trust that if the IP has a problem, what problems are there else, elsewhere? But generally, it's possible for US investors to get comfortable. So of course, the founders may not be able to transfer, but they can license. And if there's someone who was working on that product, um, so initially who is no longer with the company, it may still be possible to reach out to them to get a license. And the investor will you know, generally be happy to pay uh, um, some consideration for that, even though the person is, is no longer with the, with the company. Um, with the employees before starting a um, um, sort of transaction, I think it's very helpful for a company just to take a look at its current employment agreements and its current records of open source in order to resolve any issues before the transaction, uh, rather than during the diligence stage. Again, the better that you can present the company with the solutions already in, the more trust that you are creating and uh, there's less doubt about this evaluation. Departing founders are, are a challenge. Uh, Bulgarian law particularly uh, creates difficulties with spin-offs and mergers and sales of going concerns. Uh, but if that is part of the history of the company, again, it's worth 
uh, taking care before a transaction just to look at where the copyright ended up and if it is necessary to put a license in then to put it in um, i'm just going to skip on the last column but just to note the comments at the bottom here which is no backdated agreements um, it is reasonably common for people to sort of suggest you know this is fine we'll put an agreement in we'll backdate it to the time where it should have been there and then that's the solution um, and i have to say that that's a huge red flag for any us uk investor uh, because that's essentially it's a documentary fraud um, and so whilst it may be tempting the way to do it is to have the agreement dated today but the terms apply as of several years ago so it is possible to have the agreement um, sort of apply to previous um, arrangements but you should generally not backdate the actual agreement and uh, I've seen US and UK investors essentially walk away from a deal uh, where they've identified that that has happened. Um, so just moving on and conscious of time, um, I also just want to touch as a second topic on uh, common share and capital expectations. Um, so here now we're talking about the shares, uh, how the investor enters the company, what sort of rights they have during it and how they exit. So it is essentially like a marriage, except with a marriage, you generally only focus on the entry and you ignore the rest of it until you're already in. Um, investors want to make sure that um, once they enter, there's a proper governance process for the company and they also have uh, the right to exit and, and the way to exit. Um, so just briefly, entry, again, contribution, all of the IP within. Um, preferred rights, different rights for different stock. So um, you know, as probably everybody here knows, shares can come with different rights. Certain shares uh, for a joint stock company can have rights to extra dividends. They can have different voting rights. And that's very important for venture capital and so PE investors. They want to make sure that they're either getting the financial return and or they have control or a combination of us or both. Um, depending on the type of investor, venture capital is typically equity, but for private equity, it's often it's of acquisition financing. And they will look to the company to sort of provide a sort of security to sort of support the financing. And that brings in issues of whether under um, so Bul 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 Bulgarian law that is allowed. And uh, in uh, some cases it is, and in some cases not. On the actual living, the governance, the relations, um, investors will be looking for some minority approvals so that uh, they've got some sort of veto rights and, and uh, sort of control over some material decisions. Um, and they'll be looking to hold the founders to targets. Um, and this is the good lever, bad lever principle. Obviously, a founder ends up with two different hats on. One is the shareholder and one is the manager of the company. And often the investor will want to put a link between those two relationships so that if the founder breaches one of those, there's an impact on the other. Um, and then exit, um, you know, typical rights of first sort of refusal, uh, rights of first offer, and then drag and tag terms for those who don't know is that um, if I'm a minority investor, I don't want the uh, senior in a investor to sell his share and I'm stuck in the company. So if the if the um, 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 a majority is a sort of selling for a good value, I want the right to tag along. And similarly, the main investor wants to be able to drag you because the share price per share for 100% is always more than the share price per share for a smaller stake. So on the next slide, and I'm going to skip through uh, these a bit quicker. Um, some topics under Bulgarian law, shareholder agreements, very common. Again, US, UK, you have the articles of the company plus a shareholders agreement. And uh, the reason why they're common in the UK, US, is that they actually create ownership rights, not just a, not just a, um, um, it's a contract right. Under Bulgarian law, that's not the case. It's, it is just a contract. And uh, in fact, there's a sort of discussion really over whether a, um, a Bulgarian court would really enforce terms within a shareholders agreement. 
uh, as opposed to the articles of the company. So that's a that's quite a different uh, capital structure to UK US. A, a big difference is in kind contributions in UK US. Uh, in order to do an in kind contribution of a loan or of assets, it's simply the managers of the company which do a fair value. And as long as in their reasonable opinion, that's the fair value, then the capital contribution can take place. Here, it's different. You need a formal valuation report by court, court appointed valuers, and it's relatively burdensome. And why is that important? It's important because if you think of the growth of a company, there's going to be lots of instances where there's a in-kind contribution. And if it's burdensome, then the investor quite often will say, actually, can we think about putting the company somewhere else? And it's, it's not all about taxation, how you structure, uh, but also how you live, how new investors will be joining and how their rights are and are protected. Um, just turning to the exit here, I'm not going through every, every row. Um, on the exit, you know, all these things in typical transaction documents, call and put options, drag and tap rights, rights of first or refusal. Um, you know, Bulgarian commercial law is still relatively young. And I, I, I often say to UK lawyers and US lawyers that, you know, the reason why it's often not easy to give a straight answer is because the Bulgarian courts have not dealt with an issue or have only dealt with it once or twice. And there isn't that body of case law that you can really look to, unlike in other um, countries. Um, but generally, rights of first refusal will be recognised. Uh, drag and tag rights may be recognised, but there's a question about enforcement. So you may get the order to say, yes, we, we sort of recognise you have the drag, but actually, can you force a shareholder to a sell? It's a, it's a, it's a difficult process. Um, and then on the final one, just to note, um, particularly in the US law, you can treat share transactions as asset transactions for tax purposes. And that's often uh, a, a sort of bit of a shock for US investors that that's not possible. Um, and quite often that involves then a, a new discussion as to how to structure these sort of transaction. So on the final slide, if I may, uh, what does this mean for solving the gap? So, you know, I've, I've got here on the left hand side, you know, those things which are difficult in red under Bulgarian law, those things which are possible in uh, green, and those things which are, you know, probably possible with a bit of a sort of structuring. Um, and I, I should note that we're not here talking about getting to the legal line where there's a nice technical legal argument. We're looking at giving the investors comfort that there's going to be no complications with the process. So we're, we're looking to be very much, you know, with a very definitive, and that's how those have been classified. Um, but what's the solution? Quite often, it does involve putting a new holding structure in outside of Bulgaria. Um, so in a typical capital transaction, the founders will, you know, sort of, um, so sort of contribute their shares into a new hold co, which may be in the EU, the Netherlands, or maybe elsewhere. And depending on tax structuring, you may have a, a whole chain of those. And then you bring it, bring the uh, shareholding back, back uh, um, sort of down. Uh, but the investors are looking for this combination of flexibility. They're looking at the fact that their rights can be enforced, things like drag and tag and good lever, bad lever. And if there's a question mark about that under Bulgarian law, then the investors might say, actually, can we the hold co in? And it's nothing strange. It's nothing difficult. It's just a case of having an open discussion with the investor uh, to meet their um, um, sort of, um, expectations for these sort of transaction. Um, so that's the end of the presentation. I think on the last slide, it's just my contact details. Um, but I hope that that's given you a a bit of a headline of uh, some of the differences of expectation between UK and US investors doing deals here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, for a very interesting and informative presentation. We'll make sure that if we have any um, inquiries about investments, uh, we will uh, have it in mind. Uh, all, all the uh, trust issues that you mentioned in your presentation, that's, that's very important. 
Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Um, again, contact details uh, are in the presentation. So all of our uh, attendees can contact you directly with, um, with the inquiries. Uh, and last and very much not least, um, I would like to invite our last presenter for the day, Vladislav Antonov, uh, who is a senior associate at uh, DGKV to brief us about the recent trends in antitrust law enforcement. Vladislav, the floor is yours. Thank you, Desi. And thanks to all attendees that uh, remain with us in the, for this last presentation in this uh, busy afternoon. I'll try to keep it as short as possible, but still to explain the main aspects of the recent trend in the competition law form by, by, by the Bulgarian Competition Authority. Uh, I will discuss two decisions that the, the authority delivered this, uh, this uh, last year, actually, 2021. They are very similar because in both cases, the authority established a price fixing, mechani uh, price fixing mechanism, mechanism in, um, established by one of, by a supplier of ch uh, children products. And the uh, where uh, where the, the retailers of these products has followed this mechanism in CPC view. Uh, actually, the topic, the main topic of uh, my discussion will, will be how the authority uh, established that an agreement between the supplier and its retailer uh, existed and how these uh, parties to the agreement have, uh, uh, has, uh, have uh, accepted to adhere to this agreement. Uh, next slide, please. So the legal standards that a competition authority needs to follow in order to prove that an infringement of the competition rules has took place, and in particular that anti-competitive agreement exists, was many times being confirmed by the Court of Justice and by the Bulgarian Supreme Court, the Supreme Administrative Court. Considering the complex and concealed character of such infringement, the courts do not expect each time the competition authority to demonstrate that a written and clear agreement was executed between the parties, but still it is expected that the competition authority, the competition authority to produce sufficiently precise and consistent evidence to support the firm conviction that the alleged infringement has taken place. With respect to the agreement itself, it is accepted that this concept centers around the existence of a concurrence of wills between at least two parties. The form this concurrence uh, in of wills is manifest is not so important, but uh, as long as it, uh, it constitutes the faithful expression of parties' intention. Uh, the Court of Justice and the Bulgarian Supreme Administrative Court have also noted that the actual conduct of the undertaking concerned must be investigated in order to establish the concourse of wills. Uh, with respect to vertical agreements, the burden of proof is lower as unilateral measures applied by a supplier can evidence the existence of an agreement or a concerted practice, but uh, if at the very least tacit acceptance on behalf of the other parties is established. In a relatively recent decision, the European Com Commission applied these principles by adopting that anti-competitive agreement was in place only on the basis of a finding that retailers provide their advertising materials for review by the supplier. In the CPC decisions, the authority frequently cites this decision and many more decisions. But in, as I mentioned, two recent decisions, uh, two recent decisions suggest that the authority may have uh, further lowered the burden of proof, uh, proof. And in particular, it accepted that an unspecified number of retailers have agreed to adhere to a price fixing mechanism, mainly on the basis of uni unilateral actions of the suppliers and fragmented interpretation if in my correspondence between the supplier and a couple of its retailers. Uh, next slide, please. So the first decision is about Eventus, company engaged in the distribution of all kinds of baby and children products. The authority ran an intensive, intense, intensive investigation, including in performance down rate in the Eventus offices. And finally, in the decision that was delivered in April uh, 2021, the authority ruled that Eventus has established and maintained a retail price fixing mechanism. As there was no formal agreement, the authority explained that in such case, and in order to verify whether an informal agreement is in place, it should investigate whether the actual conduct of the parties demonstrate that there is a concourse of views to act in a specific anti-competitive way. 
Uh, the authority also explained that if such concurrence of wills is in place, the form in, in which it is expressed through some form of informal agreement or simple coordination of the, of the business activity of the parties to the agreement is not so important. Uh, so having in mind the above described principles, the authority explained that the claimed infringement took place in the context of uh, long-lasting business relations between Juventus and its customers, and it is that purchase and then resell the products supplied by Juventus. Uh, during the entire period, Juventus has notified these retailers about its recommended retail prices. The authority also explained that such recommended, recommended prices were normally determined and used by manufacturers that aim to introduce maximum price, prices, and thus to prevent the retailers to exploit the consumers by imposing too high retail prices, which on each side may lead to bad image of the products and drop in sales. Unfortunately, in the CPC decision, it's not very clear uh, what was uh, what uh, the authority established because this information is hidden as a trade sector, a secret, but it seems that in, in authorities view, the aim of Juventus was not to impose such maximum prices, but such other, but some other aim. And does the authority rule that this different aim was not achievable under regular market conditions? And thus, even in case the prices recommended by Juventus did not serve a fixed, a fixed price, still the recommendation of prices was in violation of the law. And this conclusion is rather strange because in the applicable um, guidance of the European Commission, it is, uh, it is allowed a uh, supplier to recommend prices as long as they do not serve as a fixed prices. Here, it seems that the authority does not accept this and believes that so if the, uh, the recommended prices are not, uh, do, does not amount to a, a maximum prices, they are prohibited. But this is just my conclusion. It's not very clear what is the authority uh, intention. Uh, also, the authority rejected Inventus objections that the recommended prices did not bind any of its customers and stated that a complex of practices and actions undertaken by the supplier evidence that the aim of Juventus was to convince the retailers to use the recommended prices as retail price. Uh, the actions outlined by the CPC are express manifestation that the recommended prices are preferred by Juventus, thus hindering small traders to deviate from the trade policy of the supplier. Uh, demonstration that the recommendation of prices is part of the business strategy of Juventus, because each time Juventus was approached by a new cost customer, Juventus notified it for the condition under which it may be supplied, one of which was that Juventus shall send a list with recommended prices. And also the recommended prices were used as a reference price on the basis of which the wholesale prices for each customers were calculated. Actually, Eventus used these uh, recommended prices and by applying discounts and bonuses agreed between the parties, the wholesale price were calculated. Uh, the authority outlines several other practices employed by Eventus and the common between all, they, all them was that the, they were unilateral unilateral actions with no or only limited participation from the retailers. With respect to any feedback from the retailers, the authority analyzed email communication between Eventus and only a couple of its retailers. In none of them was clearly or even remotely mentioned that the respective retailers has accepted to observe the price recommendations circulated by Eventus. Nevertheless, CPC interpreted single words or sentences as evidence that Juventus and all of its retailers have colluded to fix the retail price. And in all cases, the CPC rejected Juventus' objections that our interpretation of the email correspondence are also available. Uh, with respect to the actual conduct of the parties, the authority analyzed the prices, retail prices supplied by several retailers, and in, in view of the authority, this, this price is evidence that the retailers were following Juventus price recommendations. However, the price information is hidden as a trade sector uh, secret, and I cannot verify whether this conclusion, this conclusion is correct. But from the from the decision of the court where the uh, this, uh, CPC decision was appealed, it becomes clear that the retail prices were not so equal. Maybe that they are ju were just similar. Uh, the authority also explained. Um, yeah, this is important that the authority expressly uh, stated that there were no evidence that Juventus might influence the market behavior of its customers. 
but in CPC view, the existence of an overall strategy of Juventus to fix the retail prices was sufficient infringement to be established. And thus, mainly on the basis of unilateral actions of Juventus and fragmented interpretation of female correspondence between Juventus and a couple of its customers, the authority, the authority ruled that Juventus has proposed an un, uh, uh, indefined number of its customers have accepted to enter into an agreement with an object fixing the retail prices of the products supplied by Juventus. Uh, the other decision is about Samoyoral, Spanish company that manufactures children's clothing and uh, shoes. The authority again established the existence of an agreement between the supplier and in defined number of retailers that purchase clothes uh, and retailers. Uh, uh, most of the retail, again, most of the retailers were in long-standing business relations with the supplier. Uh, in this decision, one of the main factors for the CPC ruling was that a trade representative of the supplier has sent an email in which email he described the trade policy of Mayoral, pursuant to which the retailers were required to sell a new collection with a specific margin, dis uh, discount to be in a specific amount, and to be provided only during specific uh, periods. In this period, uh, email is also described that in case of non-compliance, the retailer should correct their prices within 24 hours of recipient notification, or the supplier shall cease supply. Interesting for this email is that the addressee, of, uh, the addressee was one of the employees of the Spanish supplier, and no evidence was found that an email with the same content was sent to any of the Mallorca, uh, Mallorca customers, and even less that any of them have accepted to comply with such requirements. The closest to evidence that the retailer were even informed about, uh, informed about this trade policy was an email again sent by the trade, rep uh, trade representative to only one of the clients in which he stated that the information about the trade policy of Mayoral was circulated to all customers. No other evidence the authority found that any of the customers was informed about this trade policy. The authority analyzed the market behavior of the retailers and compared the prices and the price determination, uh, determination met methodology applied by the part of the retailers, not all of them. Um, the exact figures are hidden as a trade sector again, but still from the available explanations, it becomes clear that the final prices and the price determination methodologies of the retailers were not equal, but only similar. However, on the basis of these findings, the CPC concluded that the retailers have accepted to follow the price instructions of the supplier, and the CPC did not make any uh, analysis whether the alleged similarity in the retail prices may have other economic explanations. Rather, it directly concluded that a price fixing mechanism was in place, and inside it sanctioned my morale. Uh, next slide, please. So on the basis of the, so the common of both decisions is that CPC did not establish acceptance of instruction or causal relations between the market behavior of distributors and the unilateral instruction of the suppliers. CPC argued that there was a very broad tacit agreement between the supplier and the re re uh, retailers to treat the recommended prices fixed. And the uh, CPC found and analyzed only isolated subsequent communication regarding price recommendation. And this was treated as an evidence that a tacit agreement existed and the retailers have accepted to adhere to the instructions and uh, to the instructions for uh, price instructions by the suppliers and to treat them as mandatory. Thus, it seems that the CPC has lowered the standard of proof for the existing vertical agreement and basis, uh, based its uh, findings only on the mainly on the unilateral actions of uh, the suppliers. Uh, both decisions were appealed before the competent court. For the time being, there is a court decision only with respect to inventors, and still it is not final as it's subject to cassation appeal. The court quashed the CPC decision. And in its decision, the court explained that during the investigation, uh, the CPC has requested information from 39 merchants that resell children's clothing. In, their sta uh, in the statements received from, this, uh, from these traders, no of them confirmed that Juventus have ever forced, it to, uh, ever forced, ever forced the respective uh, trader to apply the recommended prices. However, the CPC did not take into account these statements. Rather, it, in the decision, it only stated that it cannot credit an unverified, unverified statement 
that claims advantageous circumstances about the latch infringer. And the court explained that such principle generally should be reversed but uh, observed, but this does, does not mean that the statement should be completely ignored or only part of the statement should be held while the other parts are dismissed. And the court further explained that such statements should be evaluated together with all factual circumstances established during the investigation and the authority should collect and take into account all, rele all relevant evidence, even such that do not comply with its thesis. In case they are uncertain, is, they should be interpreted in favor of the alleged infringer and not the authority to accept that everything is clear and to, uh, and to claim that there is an infringement. Uh, the court also noted that the market for children products is competitive with many participants that offer a variety of products with different prices and quantity, quality. Uh, and the court explained that it's very unlikely in such market companies events, which do not hold, do not uh, did not hold strong market position to be able to convince much stronger retailers to follow its price policy only by virtue of circulating a list with recommended price. Uh, and after this, the court uh, analyzed the retail prices of the top three retailers that accounted for great part of Eventus turnover and found that the small, uh, smallest of them applied the recommended prices much less frequently than the other two much bigger retailers. And in court's view, this demonstrates that the similarities in the retail prices might be a result of the specifics of the markets. For example, the big retailers set their prices on their own and the small retailers follow the approach of their much bigger competitors. And this might not be due to the price recommendations uh, circulated by Eventus. The court emphasized that uh, CPC conclusion that Eventus, which did not hold strong market position, was able to convince big retailers to follow its price policy only by virtue of, circulate, uh, virtue of circulating a list of recommended prices is problematic. The court also emphasized that considering the specifics of the market and of Eventus market position, a conclusion for price fixing could be made only if the authority has established that a monitoring mechanism and some form of stimulation or for imposition of penalties for deviation of price policy existed. Thus, the court quashed the CPC decision on the above explained grounds and many more. And the common of the, the common of all uh, grounds that the uh, court accepted is that the, it did not agree with the CPC approach to base its findings on unilateral actions and one-way communication that looks suspicious when interpreted in, interpreted in isolation and to claim infringement only because this fragmented interpretation suggests existence of competitive agreement. Uh, actually, the court suggested that if all factual circumstances were taken into account, other, exp other explanation would also become, become available. The court clarified that the authority should not just disregard inconsistency with its theory, rather where such inconsistencies exist, it should dig more deeply and try to find additional evidence or provide more consistent explanation that corresponds to all factual circumstances. But as I mentioned, the decision is still subject to appeal. The other decision, there is no uh, uh, court decision for the moment. So next slide, please. Uh, yes, so the key takeaways that can be uh, derived from these decisions is that regular price recommendation by a supplier may easily be treated as a price fixing. Any recommendation on timing of promotional activities and discount may also be regarded as a test vertical agreement on prices. Suppliers, the advice that a supplier should observe is to refrain from any regular price recommendations. And whenever price recommendation, uh, recommendations are made, suppliers should be very careful with any subsequent communication with distributors on price. Uh, for the time being, we are waiting the second um, court decision about the mayoral case, and we'll see whether the CPC, the court will be so critical to the CPC fighting, uh, finding. Uh, so maybe in the next next time there will be a new update update but for the moment suppliers should be very careful when using recommended prices and communicating even when communicating with uh, its customers and retailers with respect to price and that's all thank you thank you very much uh, Vladislav. Uh, you can see the contact details uh, on the screen 
thank you for a very interesting and informative presentation that was uh, also um, important for me, for example, as a, as a consumer to know uh, how, how we are protected. Um, I would like to, to wrap up today's uh, uh, regulatory and tax update and uh, to extend the thanks on behalf of uh, the British Bulgarian Business Association to all our presenters. Uh, big thanks to the speakers from DGKV, Wolfties, Deloitte, PwC, New Balkans Law Office and Buzilov and Chanova Law Firm. Uh, thank you for taking the time of your busy schedule to prepare your presentations. We at BBBA value knowledge sharing very much. And I would also like to thank all our attendees for, uh, for being with us today. And I hope you found uh, the presentations interesting and informative as we did. And I'm sure our presenters will be more than happy to follow up with you um, on any further questions. Uh, and again, contact them directly. And uh, if you don't have their contact details, you can always do that through BBVA. With this, I would like to um, say goodbye for, for today and uh, to wish you a pleasant snowy evening. Uh, looking through the window, I can see that we'll have a challenge going back home <laughs> tonight. Uh, wish you all a great afternoon and evening and uh, looking forward to seeing you soon. Goodbye.